Hello! Welcome to a new episode of Ghoulfish on Gaming and the start of a new series of videos on the BBC Micro, a machine that was launched at the end of 1981, effectively 1982, and lasted until 1994 and could easily be seen in schools well into the early 2000s. Now, why this machine lasted so long was a combination of its history its hardware and its software. Its history has been covered a number of times on documentaries by the BBC and other YouTube stars. So I'll leave links to them in the description. What I am going to talk to you about though is its hardware and its software. How did they design these machines to last so long? And why do people continue wanting to use them for so long? So today's episode is going to be on the hardware. So let's start with the case, which was an all-in-one style common at the time. Now it was designed in a way that you would normally put a case or a, a frame at the back, which would then allow you to have your floppy drive or your cassette deck and then your monitor sat on top. Now I don't have the classic cub monitor or a floppy or a cassette drive because they are quite difficult to get your hands on these days, particularly in good working condition. So for now I'm making do with an Commodore monitor with a series of cables to plug it into the back of the machine and an internal compact flash card, it's a hard drive, and an SD card connected to the side to give me additional ways of getting software on and off the machine. So let's look at the rest of the hardware on the outside. So we start off with a pretty decent full travel keyboard. With a really nice sound to it. And you can see it has a set of very bright F keys and cursor keys. Now above that is this plastic strip, which initially you would think is just decorative, but it actually pulls up. And the reason for that is so you could put a bit of card underneath. And games and software would come with specific strips to tell you what the F keys actually did to make it more obvious and because the F keys could be anything. Next to that we have the internal speaker. So the only way to get sound out of this machine was through the internal speaker. There was no external connectors. So they actually produced a quite a loud sound and gave quite an iconic sound on startup. Under that is this cutaway flap. So if we actually cut that off and took that away, we'd actually find space straight down to the motherboard and an empty ROM socket. So this would allow us to extend the machine without having to open it up every time. We'll have a look at that and the other ROM sockets in more detail when we go deeper inside. On the front here we have three lights. We have a caps lock, shift lock and a motor lock which tells us that the cassette drive is running. We then have ports along the back of the machine for your power and video. And the rest of the ports were actually underneath the machine. And so we have a whole line of ports just underneath this keyboard, all with ribbon connector styles to make it easier to extend the machine. And the feet on the machine were actually large enough to make sure that the cables could easily get out from underneath. So Let's take a deeper look and go inside the machine. So here we are inside the BBC Micro, a chip heavy design that allowed the machine to have huge amounts of flexibility. So let's take a tour. And the obvious first stop has to be its CPU, the 6502, a chip that saw a lot of use at this time. The Apple II, the C64, the Atari 2600, and many other machines all use this processor. Most of them use this at 1 megahertz, 
but the BBC was clocked at double that at 2 MHz. This gave it a huge amount of power, and some developers even stated that they thought it was almost impossible to use up all the CPU cycles. This was obviously false, as a number of other developers really did push this machine, but it really shows how powerful this machine was. Coupled with that CPU was either 32 or 16 kilobytes of RAM, depending on the model. Now, the amount of RAM directly influenced every other aspect of this machine, as its RAM was graphics to game loading, disk loading, all systems use this RAM. They clocked it at double the CPU speed, so it was running at 4 MHz. This allowed the CPU and the graphics chips equal amount of time to the RAM. So this brings us on to the graphics processor. Now this supported three resolutions, a high, medium and low resolution, and eight colors with an additional eight flashing colors. And this allowed it to have seven different video modes. So we could have a high resolution two color mode, which allowed us an 80 column by 32 row text system. It also gave us a low resolution but high color mode, which was used primarily by games to really push the graphics of the machine. And in between, you had a mid resolution mid number of color mode, which allowed you to do more, but significantly it used up less RAM than the other two modes. High resolution 2 color, low resolution 8 color, both used 20 kilobytes of RAM. This mid range mode used 10. This meant that you had far more space for the rest of your game. Or you can be clever like Elite. The top part of the screen is a medium resolution two color mode. The bottom part of the screen is a low resolution four color mode. Between the two of them they use only 12 and a half kilobytes of RAM which is significantly less than the other modes with this level of graphics. And this was one of the party pieces of the BBC Micro that you could change video modes mid draw. But if you wanted to really cut down on how much RAM you wanted to use, you could go to its second video chip, the Teletext chip. This only used a single kilobyte of RAM, but operated in a pure character mode, unlike the frame buffer mode that the other chipset used. Well, this did not provide as much uh, colors and as re much of resolution as the other, it did allow you to do clever things. Now, this chip also saw use in TVs. Many people would have used their TV to access CFAX or Teletext and access one of the 999 pages that were available of data, whether it was weather sports, or even games, teletext was there for people, but it was also available for developers for the micro, and you could make your games with it, and you had far more space free for the rest of your game. Unsurprising, this mode was used a lot for games that also were targeting the A model. So where do we go from here? The obvious next step is sound. So we have an off-the-shelf sound processor with four channels, three square and one noise. This chip was also used in other consoles such as the Master System and the Mega Drive and some PCs like the PC Junior. It also saw a lot of use in arcade machines. The music you've been hearing through this video underneath me has been music from the BBC. So I'll shut up for a minute and let you have a listen to it clearer without me.
enjoyed that. So we're just about rounding out our trip around the major parts of the board. So we come on to our final bit, the ROM. So the main ROM in the system was Acon MOS, or Acon Machine Operating System. This was almost like the equivalent of BIOS in PC, where they expected people to develop software and libraries to target MOS. And then you could add additional languages on the side, such as BBC Basic, Fortran, etc. And they also knew that people were going to extend the BBC Micro in all sorts of wonderful ways, including extending Basic itself. And so they left a number of the ports on this board empty. So you could extend it very easily by just getting ROM chips, plugging them in. They even provided a space as part of the case, that cutout bit, that led straight to one of the ROM sockets underneath. So you could actually add new ROMs without having to open up the machine. Now, with all this in mind, we can now start looking at the ports, as the machine had a quite a number of them to also aid its expandability. The first one is actually quite a special port. It was the tube port. And it was used to actually add additional processors or coprocessors to the machine. Next to it, we have the 1 MHz bus, a general purpose bus that had two pins of it dedicated to audio input. So you can add additional audio hardware such as voice synthesizers and equivalent systems. It ran in a number of different modes which allowed it to be used for stuff like hard drives or other more powerful expansions. If you just had a simple expansion that you needed, then you could use the user port. Now this was an 8-bit serial connector, which mine has the compact flashcard connected to it. So I can add additional games and load stuff directly from it. But when we're at school, we use boards such as the control it board, which allowed us to have inputs from switches and control stuff like motors and lights. So you could program a basic program, which would then interact with hardware that you designed. Finally, the last two are the printer and floppy ports. Their names explain exactly what they do. Now we come to the back of the machine, with the first two connectors being video. So it had an RGB output, usually went to a cub monitor, but these days you can get an RGB to SCART cable, and that's how I've actually got it plugged up to my monitor. It also had a built-in RF modulator, so you could plug it up to a TV. TVs at the time didn't really like the high resolution modes, they ended up looking very fuzzy, but it was there if you wanted it. Next to it, we had the standard serial connector, we had the tape connector, which allowed you to connect a set drive to it to load up software, and finally we have the analog connector, which was generally used to plug in uh, joysticks. Now not on this picture because I don't have it is the Echonet board, which allowed you to do networking, typically over BNC sort of ring bus style uh, networks, which gave the BBC networking before many other machines at the time. So that is the inside of the BBC Micro. So there we have it, the main hardware of the machine and what it looked like inside. Now this would give you a great indicator of why the machine was powerful and how you could so easily extend it. But there was another element to why this machine was used for so long and why it was ex it did get extended and that is the user manual. So this manual 
went into detail on the whole machine from how to set it up. So you actually have diagrams on how you set the machine up with your cassette drive and your TV. But it also told you how to use BBC Basic. Most of this book is actually a programming book on how to program on the machine of every single command inside it. This ranges from sample programs to printing text out on screen, getting input from the user, how to do procedures. It would even tell you about changing colors, saving, loading, all the basic keywords. And went into doing graphics as well. But not only that, it would tell you how to work with the filing system. So this did have a filing system that you could use with the floppy drive. And later on, with hard drives. Now some of these commands were actually greatly extended by additional ROMs that you could put inside. But they would want you to use this machine to its extent. They would tell you how the serial port was connected. The commands you would need to work with these systems. And if you continue through the book towards the back, they would tell you how to expand the system and would even give you full printouts of the character map so you knew how to get all the different keys. Graph paper so you could plot out your graphics that you were wanting to draw. But on top of that, they gave you diagrams of the board, pinouts of all the major connectors. So you knew from just looking at this book how to make a cable to connect to it. You knew from this how the connectors were plugged up to the board and how you would dare to work with them. So this book is massively important to the machine because this is how everyone would have first started with the machine and would have used it and extended it. So I feel that this is just as important as this. So I've been the Goldfish and this has been Goldfish on Gaming.